I talk in the book about the fact that um, I had an arranged marriage when I was 17. I came to the U.S. as a teenage bride. My uh, husband at the time was uh, born in an immigrant family, but was raised essentially in the U.S. And uh, I went to college in the South. And I remember, um, you know, for instance, like it, it must have just been the first week, right? Where the Southern lady who's teaching English takes me aside, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, outside the classroom after class. And she's like, are you okay? Are you all right? Like, do you need help? I can help you. I can be your, I can be your help. And, you know, it, it took me years to understand um, that, you know, she thought of me as like this abused and uh, person that was sort of, um, you know, in college, but who maybe needed help because she was, uh, you know, facing the issue with that is is not that I'm not saying that immigrant women aren't subject to abuse. I worked in a domestic violence shelter uh, where I, you know, work precisely with immigrant women uh, facing domestic abuse. I'm just talking about, you know, the assumption that I would not know anything about women's rights or empowerment or empowering myself simply because I had come from Pakistan as a teenager. So, so that sort of condescension is, it's, it's rife. It's there all the time. Even now, I, uh, you know, even now after I've written books on feminism and uh, obviously I, you know, I've told my story of how I left an abusive relationship, how, um, you know, I became a single mom in law school and then, uh, you know, got myself through the bar and uh, et cetera. Even after saying all of those things, my feminist credentials are called into question or considered suspect uh, simply because I'm brown and Muslim and I'm not willing to disavow those things. Um, and um, which, you know, which goes to the central problem is that we might not explicitly be asking women to become white, to be considered feminist. But we are asking women to become white, to be included, at least in the feminist conversation, right? Because if you are don't work to be relatable, if you don't pretend, uh, you know, if you if you want to, for instance, to be taken seriously as an intellectual feminist, right? Um, uh, you shouldn't talk about your personal experience, right? My personal experience living in a shelter you know, leaving an abusive marriage, et cetera, et cetera, because um, within uh, American feminist circles, at least, uh, the people who make the decisions are not the people who have ever fought, fought any kind of frontline battles in terms of, of, of their feminist credentials. So there is a gatekeeping of sorts, which keeps women who have had, who have actually fought these battles um, you know, who've been the single moms, who've faced, uh, you know, sexual abuse. Um, there is a, a very intentional, uh, uh, intentional sort of siloing of those women as, you know, they're brought on again to tell their stories of trauma, but they're not included, for instance, in the board of directors, right? Especially yeah. not if they're public about their trauma. Um, yeah. And I just I, before lastly, um, before we run out of time, you, you just talked a little bit about um, how being a Muslim woman, you, you weren't able to be perceived as a real feminist. And it just strikes me how, you know, to bring it back to the start of our interview, um, the concept of white feminism is an extension of capitalism, how capitalism can <laughs> be it chooses which religion defines empowerment, which uh, skin color is uh, a, 
a, an extension of uh, or what's empowered, right? Which a, aka means having power in capitalist society. Um, gender, of course, as well. But like the the white feminism as a as a part of that whole, I I think is the number one takeaway. Um, Absolutely, from your book, and, and of course, it it spills over into like religion and and um the portrayal of islam as inherently um wrong in that way and and that hurts muslim feminists so much because their entire project is to try to make islam egalitarian within for women who are within the religion so you know so there are all these constant degradations that are happening and you know it, it's to take the feminist conversation forward, we absolutely have to recognize that, that, that having all these different, like Muslim feminism, Black feminism, et cetera, does not, it, it, it doesn't make feminism weaker. It makes feminism stronger because it means that you're bringing all of those people within a larger discussion so that that can be uh, you know, the basis for a collective movement. I mean, one reason why Texas has happened, I mean, it exposes the fact that we don't have a collective, politically relevant feminist movement in this country that we can draw on immediately if you have an attack like that on reproductive rights. So, you know, the the impetus is that if we can only start having this conversation about race within feminism, we will have overcome the biggest obstacle to, um, you know, a true sisterhood um, that that exists today. You know, it, it is the biggest obstacle. And it's a white feminist insistence that solidarity means listening to them um, that I hold responsible for you know, the condition feminism as a whole is in today. Well, I, I really loved your book and um, I'm passionate about this topic and I appreciate the way you communicate it um, so unabashedly and correctly in my view. Uh, uh, Rafia Zakaria, author of Against White Feminism, Notes on Disruption. Thank you so much. There you go. There's the, there's the, <laughs> there's the book. There's the cover. Uh, I like the book too. Uh, or I like the cover as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Rafi. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Folks, there's more of what you've just saw where that came from. That's if you hit the subscribe and like button. Thank you. Really, thank you.